Ladies and gentlemen, I'm overwhelmed to be here. Thank you for this enormous and nice uh, event, uh, especially grateful to Markus Wallenberg, of course. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's my real pleasure to introduce Ion Cell and its po possible place in the textile industry given the particular challenges of climate change. As an introduction, I would like to start with a short historical overview on textile fibers and spinning technologies. As you certainly know, in the early history of mankind, textile fibers were exclusively made of natural fibers. That's quite obvious, but it was evidenced by a 30,000-year-old flex fiber found in the Republic of Georgia. That's the first uh, experimental evidence of uh, textile fibers. And it's also well known that the Sumerians were able to spin and weave flex fibers many years back. And since the Neolithicum, natural fibers as we still use them today, like cotton, silk and wool, have been used as textile material. However, the development of the industrial production of textiles is a relatively new invention and it was fueled by a strong population growth in the early 19th century. It began, all began actually, at the 1889 Paris World Exhibition where Count Hilaire de Chardonnay for the first time presented a clothes entirely made of synthetic fibers. It was cellulose nitrate. And he called it artificial silk. However, due to high flammability and also high costs, it was soon replaced by viscose fibers. And viscose technology has been developed by three gentlemen, Cross, Beaven and Beadle in UK, and you are aware that this technology is still the most dominant technology for the production of man-made cellulose fibers. The development of synthetic fibers goes back to the 1930s, where the very famous chemi chemist uh, Wallace Carothers invented nylon 6-6, and 10 years later, John Rex Winfield invented polyester. So that was the start of a really, uh, let's say, growing uh, industry. Although the first uh, direct cellulose solvent, n methyl morpholine anoxide, has already been patented in 1939 by Charles Granacher, it took another 30 years until this idea was took up by Kodak, and they used this invention to develop a lyosyl process. But another 23 years later, the first commercial lyosyl plant came on stream in Mobile, Alabama, in US, by Kurt Toh first, and soon later by Lansing in Heiligkreuz, Austria. And it's still the most, let's say, uh, awarding technique for the production of man-made cellulose fibers. Three different spinning technologies produce, uh, regenerated, uh, are produced by regenerated cellulose fibers. Dry spinning, as you see here, uh, there a low boiling solvent evaporates in the spinning chamber by the introduction of hot air in a countercurrent flow, thereby gradually solidifying the filament. This technique was used for the production of cellulose nitrate and is still used for the spinning of cellulose diacetate. Of course, the most dominant spinning technique is the wet spinning technique and it is in commercial use for the cuprammonium process and the viscous process, but also for new developments, for example, cellulose carbamate and uh, a variety of different spinning technologies using diluted sodium hydroxide as a cellulose solvent like tree to textile, biosilsol, 
but also spin over, they use a pop suspension for wet spinning. And last but not least, dry jet wet spinning. It was adopted by the lyocell process, and the lyocell process uh, is connected to the use of a so-called direct cellulose solvent. And there, the spinning dope passes uh, the air gap, you see that here, and thereby um, a, a strong stretching is possible, which leads to a high orientation of the cellulose molecules parallel to their molecular axis, which is a prerequisite for strong and powerful fibers. Now I would like to give you a short overview about the global fiber market and it's amazing to look back to the last 120 years of fiber development. Until the 1990s, the per capita fiber consumption was clearly dominated by natural fibers and only then uh, the synthetic fibers basically started to be the dominant fiber species. Today we have almost a share of 70% on the global fiber consumption. Man-made cellulose fibers, in particular viscose fibers, they peaked around 1970s and uh, dropped to a minimum in the year around 2000 due to many, many closures of plants, especially in Central Europe, Europe, Russia, Americas. And during the time, uh, some of the companies also made their homework and cleaned up the sites, which was a prerequisite for the steep upswing, what you see here uh, after 2000, where a lot of new installations were built, especially in Asia and China. The biggest growth by 2030 is predicted for cellulosics. Why? The first reason is uh, cotton fiber stagnates in the growing and in the consumption. And on the other side, uh, the demand of cellulosics uh, further increases. So that's a good opportunity also to develop new man-made cellulose fiber processes. When evaluating a new fiber or even fiber category, then it's very important to assess its quality um, in reference to the main reference fibers. Sometimes that is forgotten, so we just develop new fibers and we don't care what are the uh, reference fibers, how they look like. So that's very important to have an uh, overall look at that. For the sake of simplicity, I selected uh, the strength properties as the major criterion for the uh, pulp, uh, fiber properties. And here you see um, the uh, dry and wet tensile strength of the natural fibers. Hemp and flax uh, show very strong uh, tenacities, particularly under wet conditions, even higher than under dry conditions while the major synthetic fibers also show excellent uh, strength properties and especially uh, tough, high toughness values due to uh, high extensibility of the fibers, which is very unique for synthetic uh, fibers and is very tough to achieve with cellulosic fibers. While at the same time, regular man-made cellulose fibers show quite low properties, mechanical properties, and especially under wet conditions, with two exceptions. The first one is what I mentioned already, the lyocell fibers. And due to their high orientation, they have a nice uh, and high wet tenacity. And a speciality viscous fiber, uh, we call it the Supercore 3. It's used uh, for the in re uh, reinforcement of tire cords. So these two uh, are exceptional with regard to the properties. Yeah, now what is the fate of the textiles at the end of their service life? That's uh, the $1,000 question. And currently, the textile industry predominantly follows a so-called linear business model. What does it mean? A linear business model means that the textiles basically immediately end up in landfill and incineration 
after only an average uh, wearing cycle of 20 washes. That's an average, of course. And currently, the amount of uh, textiles which are given a second life is very low. It's uh, ab about 3.5%, and most of it uh, is uh, concerned the resale or the rental. You see that uh, uh, the uh, linear business model uh, is getting an outdated uh, model and we need to look for alternatives. Why? Because, first of all, we have a, loss of, a lot of a loss of value due to this uh, short uh, uh, life cycle. And the second is, of course, an enormous pollution. So, therefore, we have to work for alternative uh, concepts. So, more in detail, where do the fibers uh, finally end up after use? Uh, of the 84% of the fibers are either incinerated or um, the landfill, of which one-third uh, consists uh, of uh, natural polymers, cellulose or protein fibers, and two-thirds of synthetic fibers. And the problem associated with synthetic fibers is not that they are not recyclable. That's relatively clear and it's possible and even uh, easily possible. But the problem is they're almost non-existing biodegradability. And that concerns many of the synthetic uh, polymers. And here you see uh, the most important representative of synthetic fibers, polyester. So basically, with the standard tests, no uh, biodegradability. And that is about to be confirmed in long-term investigations currently done by the Scripps Institute in close to San Diego. Uh, there are deep sea uh, investigations of differ different material swatches, and you see here just the comparison between polyester and lyocell. But even that is not the only problem, but it is clearly associated with the uh, most important problem associated with synthetic, fi synthetic fibers, namely the release of microplastic fiber. Yesterday, I had the privilege to sit next to the Queen, and she told me that her 10-year-old uh, granddaughter refuses to eat fish because she said fish contains plastic. Yeah? So that is really an issue and we have to work on, uh, on this uh, uh, also from, from the fundamental point of view to avoid the release of microplastic fibers upon uh, laundry. Now I would like to briefly introduce the ion cell fiber process and show step by step what role this process could eventually play in the transition to a sustainable uh, textile industry. The most important feature, or one of the most important features, is the use of a powerful uh, solvent, direct solvent for cellulose. And we selected a so-called protic ionic liquid with high thermal stability, with a high dissolution power, and with uh, an environmental footprint very comparable to n methylmorphaline anoxide. Currently, we are working with three of these protic ionic liquids, and both uh, so-called amidinium and guanidinium-based cations. And uh, the development of these uh, solvents is fully credited to my colleague, Professor Ilka Kilpleinen, and his team. Another aspect of the lyocell technology compared to the wet spinning uh, processes is the fewer unit operations. So it's a much simpler process, and it's a closed system with only one chemical uh, input. That's the solvent, and that we have to keep in the cycle. And this is also a difference to the current NMMO-based lyocell, because they have to add uh, stabilizers and also other chemicals uh, for the regeneration of ion exchange resins, for example. So we think that the concept here is uh, quite future-oriented. The decisive unit operations of the ion cell process comprise both, first, the production of a homogeneous uh, cellulose solution, 
to ensure stable spinning and of course the air gap spinning concept. Um, the manufacture of uh, these uh, highly viscous spinning dope requires high shear forces, really high shear forces, and that is uh, achieved in a kneader or in an extruder, for example. These are two examples, it's not complete. And uh, under the microscope you see a very fast and complete dissolution. Here you see pulp fibers which basically disappear upon time and when it's black it's fully dissolved. So what are actually the key innovations of ion cell? The first one is what I mentioned already, the selection of the most appropriate direct cellulose solvent. I talked about that already. And the second one is the adjustment of the flow behavior of a viscoelastic fluid, that's the spinning dope, inside the capillaries of the spinneret and also in the air gap. So what kind of flow behavior do we have? Um, in the capillaries, we have a dominant shear flow and that means that the viscosity decreases upon the deformation rate. Why? Because of the gradual disentanglement of the polymer chains and of course also their pre-orientation. And that depends on the geometry of the spinneret and of course also the conditions during the extrusion. While in the air gap we have a dominant extensional or elongational flow uh, with uh, the unique uh, observation that this extensional flow increases upon the increase of deformation rate. Why? Because of the parallel orientation of the molecular chains. So these two different flow patterns we have to tackle and that's the innovation uh, of this process. And here you see two examples of a stable spinning in the air gap. I hope you see it. And what you should observe is that the filaments uh, uh, exiting from the spinnerets align in parallel as soon as you apply a stretch. And here you see the goddess where the stretch is applied. And the stretch ratio is much higher than in all the other spinning technologies, which ensures a high molecular orientation, a prerequisite for high strength properties. Besides the high tenacity, Ion cell fibers have this natural luster, which not always is a desired property, but in most of the times. Now, what is the sustainability? We claim sustainability. What is the sustainability of the ion cell process? It, uh, is, the sustainability is ensured by a complete closure of the solvent and the water cycles. Here you see a scheme, I promised it's the only one. Uh, it's a closed cycle of the, uh, of the solvent. And in numerous trials, my dear students and colleagues have tested the recyclability of the, of the solvent. Uh, using here, for example, this thin film evaporator. And uh, at the moment, uh, uh, we state that uh, the recovery rate of the ionic liquid is around 99% or above. This is of course with the restriction that this is a batch mode where we simulate a continuous flow uh, in this case for 20 cycles. Now I come to the next topic which concerns the raw materials. This is very important and uh, we will hear uh, a talk from uh, Frank Meister after my talk uh, how important the properties of the raw materials for example, wood pulp uh, is on the process, processability and on uh, the fi uh, final products. I was so lucky in Alto University that I had a team, even though we had a small device for spinning, we could produce, look at that, uh, a numerous amount of nice dresses. And that was only possible by the help of my students, my researchers, and also by the help of the researchers from our School of Arts, the Department of Textile Design, who take care, took care of our yarns, what we produced, and then manufactured uh, fabrics through weaving, through knitting, then finishing, dyeing, everything, designing, and even the fashion show. They covered everything. 
So from wood to fashion show, that's the cradle. Of course, we need to look ahead um, and the future is a good balance between the use of sustainable uh, wood pulp from sustainable forests and recycled uh, textile wastes. And so <clears throat> I show you a selection of different um, uh, cellulosic wastes we were able to upcycle. The first example uh, concerns cardboard waste. Uh, that was in the very beginning when we started and you see it was possible that we could convert the cardboard waste to staple fibers, to yarns, to fabrics and they look a little bit different so they have different color. The reason for that is the different lignin content which also shows that our process can also take in other biopolymers like lignin, hemicellulosis, chitin, chitin, chitosan and so forth. And the difference in the colors, our designers liked it because they could play with the colors, so the different yellowish, brownish colors, and that was because of the different lignin content. Another important example is the recycling of more or less uniform textile wastes. In this particular case, it was the uh, old chain. And in this case, we not only recycled the cellulose, but also the vet dye. And uh, we could uh, basically preserve the, the color and you see this nice baby shirt and that is from the old gene. Another example or two other examples of post-consumer cotton waste in the upper one, a more difficult uh, task uh, uh, which was uh, solved by Simone, my PhD student at that time. And her task was to concomitantly recycle the reactive dyes. And reactive dyes is a different issue because they are covalently bonded to the cellulose, so it was not so easy. But still you see that it was possible and uh, we had a small fading of the color. What you also see on the right side, you see, I don't want to give you the details here, but there is a yellowish area and a greenish area. The yellowish area symbols the uh, strength properties of the virgin fibers. Uh, on the market and the yellowish, uh, the strength properties uh, of the upcycled cycle. And you see, okay, without seeing the numbers, it's up and to the right. So it's better than the virgin colors, uh, virgin fibers. And the same applies to the wasted cotton roll towels. Also there, we had very successful recycling results. The same also with hemp waste, uh, we played this through. A very important invention was also the selective uh, separation of cotton polyester. Why is that so important? Because these are the most abundant blends on the market, so we need to look for solutions uh, to uh, recycle both parts of this blend, both in this case polyester and cellulose. And through our process, a selective dissolution of the cellulose is possible, which directly leads to the spinning of ion cell. And the residue is pure enough to be also further utilized either by chain extension or repolymerization. This is a very unique uh, example. And the Bank of Finland and the European Central Bank contacted us and said, okay, Every year, 6,000 tons and more of old banknotes are incinerated. This is high-value cellulose. Come on, what to do with that? So we can't always uh, incinerate them. And so they supported us and our student here. And indeed, it was possible to recycle the banknotes and produce yarns and fabrics. And the last example I show you is also quite nice because uh, this is what I didn't know, the production of luxury textiles. They use a lot of uh, cashmere wool or silk and by producing the products uh, there is a lot of loss of these valuable fabrics. So they can't use them, maybe in insulation or something like that. So it's a waste of material and, and, and uh, cost. So uh, we decided to, to use this in a blend with the cellulose and produced a nice hybrid cellulose protein fibers. And to our surprise, we found that by blending the proteins with the cellulose, 
the su surface hydrophilicity was completely changed, and also what is a, an issue in lyocell. I don't know if, if you know that, namely the tendency of fibrillation, and that was massively reduced. So that was a great achievement. We never thought about that. Now I come to my end. Which role, I come back to my first question, can IONCEL play in the business model predicted for 2030 and beyond? And of course, that must be a circular business model. And uh, according to a recent uh, Ellen MacArthur study, um, it's predicted that 23% of the global value of uh, the textiles will basically given a second life, which does not look very much, and mostly achieved through resale and rental, not uh, due to recycling in that sense. But still, even this share of 23% represents a value of 700 billion US dollars and, what is even more important, uh, a decrease in uh, greenhouse gas emissions of 340 million tons. Now, before I would like to come to the final end and make my final assessment um, about ion cell, I want to pick up this idea from Alan MacArthur. They made, pinpointed down to three ambitions. Ambition one is uh, to ensure biodegradability through renewable resources. I think that is fulfilled. Do you agree? Okay, we can say yes. So there are two more ambitions, and they are governing, governing the longevity of the textiles. And the first criterion is the mechanical strength. So our, our hypothesis is with increasing high, uh, mechanical strength, the longevity of the textiles is also positively influenced. And the second is, of course, also to increase the utilization rate by chemical recyclability. And we will then step by step address these questions. First, uh, the higher longevity through higher mechanical strength properties. Um, to this end, we need to return to our graph showing uh, the list of uh, representative fibers on the market with related to their strength properties. So you remember this graph. And in our development, the ion cell uh, fibers we centered in the development of a so-called regular fiber, which uh, is a low-cost fiber, so with wood pulp of uh, uh, relatively uh, yeah, low purity, um, and that is our standard grade. And then, of course, also we started to investigate the so-called high tenacity grade, especially high tenacity in the sense of high toughness. That's important for textiles. And these two grades, you see, fit quite well into the upper range of this uh, mechanical of the uh, uh, of the mechanical properties of these fibers. So I would say, and together with the more detailed uh, showing, the stress strain behavior of ion cell clearly exceeds uh, the stress strain behavior of uh, commercial cellulosic fibers on the market. So we could conclude, in short, yes, ambition two more or less fulfilled. And then the third ambition, we have to look if the chemical recyclability is also uh, insured. And we took that very seriously. And we started two years ago with a big program with two students from different fields uh, to test the recyclability of our own fiber following this clear scheme from pulp, ion cell, staple fibers, yarns, fabrics, and 50 washi. Can you imagine how much work that is in the laboratory? Unbelievable. Uh, so we had to really produce a lot of fibers and produce fabrics, uh, 50 washes and so forth. And we managed uh, to uh, achieve two complete uh, cycle steps. That's enormous. And of course, as expected, the so-called degree of polymerization is affected over the stages. But, and that is where I have to use my pointer, very amazing. You see here during the washing, 50 washes, basically no change in the degree of polymerization occurred, which is a clear indication that uh, these fibers have a high durability. So 
that was amazing. We did not expect that. Uh, together with more detailed uh, GPC measurements, we, yeah, and you see also here that the tenacity was still on a good level, even though we used uh, the degraded cellulose as an input for the production of uh, ion cell fibers. But together with additional measurements, uh, we calculated the so-called chain scission. When you have one molecule, then you can easily calculate how many uh, scissions you have per molecule. And with this information, you can calculate uh, the number of chemical cycles with different assum uh, assumptions. We, the first assumption was an initial viscosity of 600, then we end up in two full chemical cycles. When we increase it a little bit, then we have four cycles. Of course, this is a theoretical consideration. In practice, we would run the ion cell process at constant dp. That means that we have to uh, compensate for the decrease in uh, polymerization, degree of polymerization by the blending with other uh, substrates. But this is what we found out and experimentally verified two chemical cycles. So that means that we can make our final conclusion Yes, ambition to longevity through highest tensile strength. Yes, we can say that has been achieved. And of course, we have to further improve that. And also the chemical recyclability. The first indication is yes, it was approved. And we can say it is really achieved. So we can say that ion cell has the potential, at least, to allow uh, a real uh, prolongation of the life cycle of uh, the textile fibers. Now, what is uh, the future of ion cell? Um, a short outlook on, on that. And we were quite busy, thanks to our generous support from Alto University, to basically build up uh, a pilot plant during the pandemic. So our engineers, our students utilized the time and built up a nice pilot plant. And a few months ago, we founded a startup company named Ion Cell OE. Yeah, quite logical name. And now the real reality starts because from beginning of next year uh, until end of 2024, we have to show that this process is capable of running in a continuous mode, that the recyclability of the solvent is as we have predicted in the batch mode. That is, of course, clear. And if everything goes out as we uh, think and hope, then uh, in 2025, uh, we will start with the next steps. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your patience. Thank you for uh, basically uh, attending this nice conference. But my special thanks uh, go to the Markus Wallenberg uh, Committee for awarding this prize. Uh, of course, to Alto University and the Finnish uh, government uh, for their great financial support, for the ERCO Foundation, which enabled the building and financing of the pilot plant. Very happy about that. And of course, uh, to my colleague Ilka Kilpleinen and his team for the successful and excellent collaboration. And this is the most uh, important treasure you have at the university, good students, and we had a lot of them, and researchers and colleagues who uh, contributed to this work. And last but not least, I have to say, Lansing HE, without having worked there for 25 years plus 5 years, 30 years, it would not have been possible to enter into this project. So I'm very, very happy about that. And uh, uh, Lansing, AG also publishes a scientific journal, Lenzinger Berichte. And to my mind, it's the highest level publication on these issues. And please have a look. It is, uh, it's online. You can access it. And the latest uh, edition also gives you some insight about my life at Lenzing and, of course, also later. And finally, also thanks a lot to my family who endured my Finnish diaspora for 15 years. Thanks a lot.